given the rain and the delays, we'll get started in about five minutes. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Thank you for coming out here on this wet, drizzly day, and I hope you're all looking forward to the final day of Wikimania. Um, we are in Social Machines 8, and we'll be running for about an hour and a half, and our first speaker this morning will be Thomas talking about mobile. Good morning, everybody, and thanks for coming on this rainy day. Um, and greetings to anybody who's watching it remotely as well. You're missing out by not being in person. <laughs> My name is Thomas, I'm Director of Mobile at the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, I'll be joined today by two developers, Ryan Kaldari, who works on the mobile web team with me, and Shira Smith, who works on the fundraising team. Today we'll be talking to you about the world of mobile web, presenting it from a developer perspective, presenting it from a product perspective, sharing some case examples, some best practices, and really showing you the urgency of the upcoming mobile convergence that, that's happening. And hopefully, by the end of this talk, we'll inspire you to be able to start thinking more actively about mobile, thinking about how to build for mobile, and thinking about the tools that you use regularly that may not be ready for it yet. So, why is mobile so important? You see more devices show up every day, you see mobile technologies increase every single day, and you start to see a lot more people getting connected. And from an industry standpoint, it's a huge driver that's moving things forward. But within the Wikimedia context, what does that mean? This is a traffic graph from oh, last year. I should probably get to updating this one. But the crazy thing about it is that you can see that our traffic has been rising 
rising steadily over the last last many years. And then around mm, roughly 2012, 2013, when we take a look at desktop traffic, things changed. We started sloping slightly down. And if we take a look at that bottom graph, which showcases mobile traffic, we can see that it's starting to rise. And back in 2013, it's starting to pick up pretty aggressively. And a lot of us were having pretty active conversations about what that meant for then and what that means for now. We project it forward. We project it forward all the way to 2015. We've tried a lot of different growth models of what that means to our traffic, our users, our tools. And no matter which model we choose of our growth, we see that by the end of 2015, maybe a little earlier, maybe a little later, we're going to see convergence. And we talk a lot about convergence on mailing lists with you guys at the office. What we mean by convergence is when desktop and mobile meet. And that's a really big change for our project. It's a huge change in how we think about what we build. And it's a huge change in our tools. And it's a huge opportunity for us. A lot of people start to worry about convergence like this because they feel like that's just not how Wikipedia works. These are fundamentally different tools. And that's scary. And the truth of the matter is, is that those are all pretty much true. But it's a huge opportunity for us to rethink about how we build things, rethink the workflows, rethink the tools that we've built, and look back at what our users are trying to do and rebuild some and augment others. Thankfully, at the foundation, we have a great team that's been thinking about this. Ooh, slides. This is a set of photos of the mobile web development team, Ryan, Mariana, Julius, John, Max, Arthur. I've been thinking about this problem for, for quite a while, engaging with, with some of you on some of the tough questions about what does it mean for this upcoming mobile convergence, and what does it mean for our desktop, mobile, laptop, and handset users from tablets. We have some great designers that we worked with, Viva, Mois, Katie there. You might have seen some of them walking around. We've been thinking pretty actively about what are we going to do next? And one of the big questions that we always ask ourselves is, how will this work on mobile? Everything that we build, everything that we look at, we ask the question, how will this work on mobile? And that's the question that, that I hope that at the end of this talk, you'll start thinking about pretty actively. Whether you're a bot author, an extension writer, a casual editor, I want you to start thinking about how will what you use work on mobile? And if it doesn't, how are you going to get it to that point? Because, as you saw in that convergence graph, by the end of 2015, plus or minus a little bit, half of the people that browse Wikipedia are going to be on mobile devices. And we want to be able to reach those users. You'll hear various people talk today about the range of users that we're trying to meet and the new users that have never been on the internet before. Half of our traffic is coming to mobile. And if the tools, the editing workflow, how you think about Wikipedia doesn't encompass mobile, you're going to miss a huge part of the audience. And we want to be able to engage that audience. We want to rethink about how that workflow goes. Now, within the mobile team, we, ask, we think about one other tenet. And of course, part of it is the, is the talk that I'm giving here. We really want to be able to empower you guys to ask these questions and build for mobile. And really, at the end of the day, the mobile web engineering team strikes to not need to exist. And what we mean by this is that we want to build the infrastructure, we want to build the tools, and we want to empower you to think about what's best for our, our mobile users. We have some ideas, but you guys will be able to take this far further than we could do on our own. And we're hoping through talks like this and talking with us here at Wikimania, we can spur some conversations, work on code, and really push the infrastructure to work well for our mobile users. So there's a couple of things that you need to think about as you're building for mobile, regardless if you're a developer, a PM, or just something somebody to thinking about tooling. And today we'll talk a little bit about constraints, responsiveness, and context. And these are just a small amount of the things that you need to think about. But they encompass some really important points that begin the conversation of how you think about engaging with your mobile users. So let's talk about constraints first. Even though phones have gotten really fancy, you know, in my pocket here, I have a, a Nexus 5 phone, which is incredibly fast, has a great screen, good connectivity. That's still a small portion of what the world has in terms of different devices. We still see candy bar phones, Nokia phones like the ones that you see there that have a pretty small screen, pretty low resolution, and arguably, even the Nexus 5 that I have here is not that large of a screen in the grand scheme of things, which is a pretty different dynamic when you're building tools for a large desktop. 
Softer keyboards. Softer keyboards are horrible. I mistype everything that I put in my mind. I wouldn't be surprised if it happens to a lot more people bad than just me. And anything that's incredibly text heavy suffers from this as well. Slow connectivity, you know? I'm lucky to be able to live in San Francisco. It's a great city and I have connectivity some of the time. You travel through the world, it's pretty highly variable. Sometimes you have a connection, sometimes you don't. I have no idea why that is. How do your tools think about that? How do tools that normally think that they have connectivity at all times react when they don't? That's a pretty big change in how we've been building our tools. Battery life. And the way that I try to think about this is that I had this first listed as slow phones. And to be fair, phones have actually gotten a lot faster. You know, they've increased dramatically in terms of CPU power, in terms of memory. But batteries are still horrible. I don't charge my phone every day. It's pretty much a paperweight. And that hasn't really gotten that much better. As we start to build our tools and we start to think about what happens on the client, you know, what happens on the phone versus what happens on the server, batteries play a really big, big thing in how we build our tooling and how we think about those tools evolving. Responsiveness. One of the interesting thing about mobile devices is that they're always with you. And one of the tenets that you hear a lot about is responsive design. In fact, you know, here's a slide about responsive design here. And what's really interesting about responsive design is, you know, sure, we'll, we'll, we'll even talk later about a case example of how you uh, change your layout. But the bigger tenet is, is that your application is aware of and can react to different environments. And that's a pretty big dynamic shift than what we've seen on the desktop where you're trying to solve a problem, a functional problem, and as you evolve your tool, it still tries to solve that problem. It doesn't really think about the context, the responsiveness uh, of where it is. Context. And context can encompass a couple things. On the right side here, you have a nearby feature that we have for the mobile website. And what I mean by context is that the phone has so much more available than a traditional desktop in terms of sensor information, in terms of location information. And on the mobile website, we decided to add a nearby feature, I think we added it about two years ago, um, to showcase data that had never really been surfaced that well about what's around me. And I think that's a pretty big dynamic shift for Wikipedia, which a lot of people traditionally think is that dusty encyclopedia on the shelf, the Google search result. What we suddenly said with the nearby feature is that Wikipedia is all around you. The data that you're getting access to is everywhere that you go. And we want to be able to put that right in front of you. Attention span. You have so much less time to be able to have anything happen on a mobile device, sometimes because it's slow, sometimes because of connectivity, sometimes because somebody's just on a bus. And on average, maybe a couple seconds, a minute, five minutes, it ranges pretty dramatically. And that's something they have to start thinking about pretty actively as you're developing your software. And you're really thinking about, how am I gonna do this as quickly as possible, as simply as possible? Timeliness. Notifications have been really interesting when it comes to mobile spaces because they almost allow the software that you interact with to travel with you as you go, to let you know that things have happened. We no longer live in a world where I have to start an action and then go back to find out that something has happened. We can start to think about and be notified when something has actually happened. So here's just a quick screenshot of the nearby feature used at the Barbican, showcasing some of the areas that are near me and really thinking about how can we highlight this and how can we highlight the information that's around me. So hearing a lot of this, I've talked with a ton of developers and there's a lot of common worries that, that happen. Some of those worries include, I, I already spend so much time developing for one, how, how am I gonna even start thinking about anything else? I don't have mobile users, I'll do it later and a number of other common, common comments that, that I hear. And hopefully by the end of this presentation and the others that'll happen right after me, we'll be able to answer some of these and motivate you and showcase that actually if, if you wait, it's much more painful. And certainly what you've seen from that convergence graph is that if you don't think you have mobile users, I would challenge that and say, you, you likely will. And if you don't have them yet, you definitely have, will have them in the future. And the variety that you get from those users is pretty dramatic. So they're important to engage. So let's talk about some case examples of how we've taken some of these tenets and started thinking about applying them and evolving 
how we build for mobile. And the first one that some of you may have already seen is the winter prototype that Brandon Harris has been working on. It's an infrastructure, it's an idea, it's, it's a prototype of how Wikipedia may evolve in the future. And certainly from a mobile context, it's really interesting because its layout is broken up really neatly for us to rearrange elements as necessary. So by default, when we look down at the desktop, really a display that's fairly wide, you see a three column structure that's showing up that shows you all sorts of interesting layout and information. But as you start to shrink it, on the left, you see that things change. The sidebar goes away. And if you keep shrinking, you can see that the right side scrolls away. I should say scrolls away, di disappears. And what's important about this is that the interface is responding to what's happening. And that's really what we're talking about here is that independent of what device that it's on, the functionality may change slightly, but the core information continues. And that's really important to our tooling. It's really important for you as a developer, you as a PM, you as a community member, to start thinking about how your tools will change as they're used on various devices. Because they'll be used on a handset, they'll be used on a tablet, they'll be used on a desktop. And we want to make sure that you're empowered to be able to build for all of those and think about how the experience may need to change across them. Let's get past the demo. So how do we begin to think about that? What do we do under the hood to make that happen? Well. In terms of responsive design, CSS media queries are really important. And I'll only touch on these pre pretty lightly, so don't worry about too much technical detail. Media queries are a great addition to the CSS spec that allow us to be able to specify how layout works based on orientation, based on width, and it allows us to, to constrain what we show depending on the device. So here, I'm pulling out just a section of uh, bread and CSS that constrains the display to be a max width of 320 pixels. So what's that for? It's likely for, for a handset. These are the elements that we're turning on when we know that we're in a handset. But if we're on a desktop, we're not going to bother with these. It's going to be different. This is limiting what happens on the handset, but it's the same exact code that will get delivered to all users. Here's another example within Winter of being able to constrain base on width and thinking about how does this one single application respond to the environment that it's in. Media queries give you a lot of powerful tools to be able to think about layouts with orientation, and in general, are great ways to start thinking about how you augment your layout and how you begin to think about the different environments that your application be in. And that's really the fundamental thing that, that's gonna change for you as you start thinking about your tools is that they no longer will be on that laptop, on that desktop. They may be anywhere. And the big challenge for you, and I think the big opportunity is, how can you get even more done as you start thinking about these different layouts? Next, I'll pass to Ryan to talk a little bit about some of the lessons learned from another mobile feature that we built. Hello, I'm Ryan Caldari. I'm a developer for the mobile web team. I'm going to talk a little bit about the mobile uploading interface. Uh, so last year, uh, we decided that we wanted to introduce an uploading workflow onto the mobile site. Um, and this may sound you know, like a fairly easy thing to do because we already have an uploading interface uh, in MediaWiki, uh, but if you think about applying that in a mobile context, uh, it doesn't really make that much sense because uh, you know, if you've used special upload on commons or somewhere, you know that the entire process is fairly complicated, especially if you're starting out from an article on English Wik Wikipedia, for example, and you just want to add an illustration to it. First, you have to figure out that uh, the the place you want to upload isn't actually English Wikipedia, it's actually Commons, so you have to go to Commons, um, and then you go into the interface, you add the source, the author, choose a license, add categories, um, all of which you know fairly text heavy, require a fair bit of interaction, um, are not good for somebody who might you know only have a little bit of time to do this and doesn't necessarily even make sense for mobile, because uh, you know, if somebody's uploading an image from a mobile phone, in, you know, in the majority of cases, the source is gonna be their phone and the author is going to be the owner of the phone. And we can also streamline it more by just uh, giving them a default license um, and making a few assumptions that should uh, make it an easier, more streamlined interface for mobile. Uh, so what we ended up doing is we actually added two interfaces, one for just uploading images directly to Commons and one that simultaneously adds the image directly into the article uh, after you upload it. 
Um, so the way that we did this is we implemented it as a call to action that was displayed to all users on article pages. Um, so let's see, go to the next slide. Okay, here we are. Okay, so you're on an, an article on English Wikipedia, and you see a call to action that says add an image to this article. You click on that, and uh, it'll show you an interface. Um, uh, basically, it'll, it'll let you either choose an image from your phone or let you take a new one, and then give you a really simplified interface for describing it, um, and then it automatically assigns the CC by SA license to it. So this is a much more streamlined interface, much easier to use, much more tailored to mobile users. Um, and then after they upload it, uh, it gives them a little uh, spinner that shows them that it's uploading and they're, they're actually back at the article so they can continue reading it while it's uploading. And then once it's uploaded, the, the image automatically gets inserted into the article for them. So they don't have to go edit the article and add a bunch of syntax um, and go through all the other hoops that you would have to on desktop. Um, so uh, these are some real life examples of some images that were uploaded through the mobile interface. Um, you can see that you know they were uh, some of them were kind of random, some of them were kind of low quality, um, but it basically it you know uh, most of the people who were using it um, you know had some intentionality behind it. Um, you know a lot of them were adding images to articles that didn't otherwise have any images. Uh, a lot of which were difficult to acquire images because you know, it was about some subject that was in a part of the world where people didn't have a lot of desktop computers. So having this interface on mobile provided a unique opportunity to acquire images for these articles. Um, but there was also kind of an unintended side effect of making it incredibly easy to upload images from your mobile phone. Um, and that is what we came to call the selfie apocalypse. Um, because it turns out that people really like taking pictures of themselves with their cell phones um, and they also, on some occasions, like adding images of themselves into articles. Um, so we kind of had a problem with that when we initially launched this. Because when, when we initially launched it, we displayed the call to action to everyone on Wikipedia, even non-logged in users. Um, so what we realized we had to do was iterate on this and try out uh, some different versions of the interface and figure out how to mitigate it so that we were maximizing positive contributions while keeping the feature intact. Um, so the first thing that we did was uh, we got rid of the call to action for anonymous users and so we only displayed it to people who were logged in. Um, and luckily this had uh, a pretty positive effect on increasing the ratio of positive contributions. Uh, another thing that we did is we added a bit of education to the interface about copyright issues and trying to basically nag the user into thinking about whether or not this is appropriate to upload and is appropriate for Wikipedia. Um, because we also, in addition to people taking uh, pictures of themselves, we had a fair number of people who would just find images on Google and upload them into articles without thinking about the copyright implications. So we introduced uh, some tutorials and some kind of uh, additional wording around that into the interface. Um, and we actually tried a few different iterations of this to see how it affected things. Um, so we had the designers help us come up with a few different workflows uh, that kind of presented the information in different ways um, and tried to present some clear messaging around copyright restrictions. Um, and actually, we're still refining this workflow to try to maximize it. Uh, one of the things that was actually kind of interesting that we noticed was that uh, it didn't actually matter that much um, like what, uh, like uh, how the, the interface for presenting like the warning and copyright information was, pretty much like any kind of warning and interstitial that interrupted the user had about the same effect. Um, so in the end, what we decided to do was to actually just uh, integrate the copyright warning and stuff directly into the described step of the uploading interface. Um, and we're, we're actually st still uh, iterating on the entire uh, interface currently. Um, in fact, right now, uh, one of the things we just did recently was we actually limited it to only show the interface for auto-confirmed users um, because we're, we're trying to like collect data on how much uh, restricting it increases the ratio of legitimate positive contributions to commons versus things that are later deleted uh, because we don't want to create a lot of unnecessary extra work for commons admins. So we're trying to like basically get into a, you know, a sweet spot where the ratio is high enough that 
they're not going to complain, even though they're, they're, they're always going to be some images that won't be appropriate. Um, so I think the main lesson that we learned from this is um, basically that mobile users aren't the same as desktop users, and each interface has to be tailored to suit your particular audience and device. And a lot of times it's, it's hard to even know uh, what that's going to mean for your interface. So it's good to have an open mind about it and be willing to iterate and change your design as you're working on it. Um, and not just you know, make assumptions and go with those because usually if you make assumptions they're going to turn out to be wrong. Because uh, especially with mobile where devices are changing all the time, you have to constantly be revising things and reinventing yourself. Um, so that's it for me. Now we'll have uh, Shira come up and talk about some work that she did. Hello. I'm Shira. And I'm going to tell you about this game that I worked on for the hackathon. So um, the idea behind the game was to provide a way for people to um, kind of validate um, data as they were looking at a page that they were already looking at. Um, so am I actually on this page? Um, so here's what you do. You are reading, 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 and you get this question that pops up. Um, and then you you have probably read and can verify did he work for IBM? Um, this is Paul Rand, not to be confused with Rand Paul. And you say, well, most people said not sure. So you click not sure, and then it tells you that was what we did. And then you say. Yay, ask me another one, and then you just keep flipping through. So this is like a prototype. So we just wanted to see, we, we went out and we tested this on users to see um, if they got it, if they knew where their data was going, um, and kind of no, not at all. So we iterated on that, and we have another version, and so I'm, I think I'm short on time, so I'm just gonna say if you would like to help me test it, you can find me and we'll help you test it. But some of the challenges, for this was, I'm not actually a mobile developer. I actually am on the fundraising team. Um, Katie's over here. Um, so um, I had to think about things in a different way than I normally do. Um, the biggest thing that I had to think about was um, that I'm not just doing click events, I'm doing um, swipe events. So I had to do tap events. Um, and the other one, I guess, would be just trying to figure out a way to present things on the screen that aren't obnoxious. Um, one of the biggest feedbacks that we got was, ah, is this, <laughs> this sucks. This, this is disruptive. <laughs> I don't care. Um, it could go away. Um, so that's a really big challenge that I actually still don't know the answer to how to fix that. So maybe you guys can help me. That's it. <laughs> See if I can get that other window to come back. Let's see. Can you Oh, that works. That's because I thought it would be. All right. So, hopefully, set some of those stories give you a little better perspective on what it's like to start to think about mobile and how it's different, how it lets you reach a different user class, and hopefully, it's starting that conversation in your head to really think, how can I begin to deliver my tool, the editing workflow that I built, or just the just thinking about Wikipedia in a different way to new users. If you want to get and if you want to start to, to tinker and if you're a developer, things have gotten really easy to be able to start working with the mobile interface. Uh, there's a great tool called Vagrant that is a virtual machine that you can install on your laptop and it'll be it'll be a, a what's the best way of thinking about it. Well it's a virtual machine that, that will have MediaWiki out of the box for you. And if you're somebody who's developed with MediaWiki before, you, you know how much of a pain it's been to install in the past. Well, it's gotten a lot easier. Um, MediaWiki.org is a great bigger page that talks to you about setup, and I'm happy to chat with you outside of the presentation about being able to install that. 
What's really great is that if you want to enable the mobile extension um, called Mobile Frontend, is that there's already a role available for that. So it's really as simple as Vagrant enable mobile frontend. In the background, it'll be able to install all the components that you need to have MediaWiki be mobile aware. And you can start to see how we built some of our interfaces, what we're thinking about these features looking like in the future. And you can start thinking about how this applies to your users as well. Okay, so what's next for us? Well, we've talked about a lot of the good lessons learned, some of the things that, that we still need to get better about. There's still a lot of work in front of us. Uh, currently, in our, if you want to build a UI within MediaWiki, you have a lot of choices. You have a lot of infrastructure, and that makes it really difficult. You know, we talked about media queries, we talked about old front end. There's not really a standard way of building interfaces across screen sizes, and there's some very active discussions happening between uh, the engineering teams, developers like Trevor Pascal, uh, John Robson, and a number of others are starting some really good conversations to think about, how can we think about interfaces in the future? How can we make them modular? And how can we think about building these so that they scale for the future? There's a new extension called Mantle that the mobile web team has been tinkering with, which allows us to start thinking about all these mobile components that we've built that, well, they came out of the mobile world, they're really infrastructure that a lot of other teams want to build for mobile, and maybe for the desktop, are starting to think about as well. And it's really a holding space for us right now as we start to think about making MediaWiki mobile aware right out of the box. Currently, you know, we're happy where with mobile frontend has gotten, but what we really want to be able to get to is to have it be within MediaWiki proper. And that's still a big challenge in front of us, and there's still a lot of work that needs to happen. But what we want to be able to have for users is that when you install MediaWiki, it's aware of mobile devices, there's an infrastructure to be able to, to build for mobile devices, and you can simply and cleanly build interfaces and experiences to your users for mobile, for, te for tablets, and for, for the desktop. Best way to get involved? Join our mobile main mailing list. You'll see the majority of our, of our community discussions, our team discussions, pretty much everything that, that we do happens on this mailing list, and it's the best way to stay abreast about what we're working on, the questions that we're trying to solve, and a lot of your great ideas that are coming to, to fruition or ones that we may have not thought about yet that we're hoping to be able to move forward on. So, just as I started on this presentation, I'm hoping that you're starting to think about the tools, the experiences, and thinking about how do they work for mobile? Because, as we know, whether we like it or not, as Lila mentioned the other day, that mobile convergence is coming, and we want to be able to support all of these new users. Thank you. I'm not sure how we're doing on time for questions, so I can... Okay, looks like we have a couple of minutes for questions. Any questions? Uh, Roger. Uh, Roger. about uh, the loading of the features seems great. Mm -hmm. The loading of the few pieces of lack of features. Have you thought about loading short videos as well? Ooh, video's great, great idea. Mm -hmm. Sure, so the question was, sure. we've gotten really interesting photo contributions, and those have done well. What about video contributions? Yeah. Video is challenging when it comes to mobile. Um, certainly from a functional perspective, it, you could do it, but there's a lot of things that will suddenly get in your way when it comes to proprietary codecs. There's some great um, presentations that happened I think yesterday or the day before about work that Brian Berger has been doing about standardizing all of Vorbis video. But really, at the end of the day, open source codecs and devices that support them are few and far between right now. You know, H.264 is the most common standard for video encoding on mobile devices. It's patent encumbered. And that's something that goes against the ethos of our projects. And that's something that we had a great community discussion about. And you guys as the community decided that, you know, even though this would increase the amount of video contributions, it's not worth compromising the, the open source tenets that we have for ourselves. So what we've done recently is start to experiment. And Brian's done some great experimentation there to think about, all right, can we do it with all? And I think that that's a great idea. I think there are just some technical and legal um, blockers in front of us to do that. Mm -hmm. Right behind. You're welcome.
Mm -hmm. So the question was, uh, the mobile website has definitely increased in terms of its feature set, it has editing, it has photo uploads. What is that in relation to the apps that we have? And for anybody who's not familiar, we have a native app on Android, we have a native app on iOS. And what's been really interesting about the apps is that we've been able to leverage things that have classically been really difficult on mobile web. There's a lot of features that we've had to pass on mobile web because we just can't make them work consistently. And the one feature that we'll touch on, we can certainly spend time talking about it after, is the fact that you can save articles on the app. And that seems like a very simple feature, right? You can save articles, that's great, that's wonderful. But in the developing world, we don't think as much about that as a significant feature. During the hackathon, I was talking about the visiting students from Kazakhstan, and they were asking me about what's the important feature sets that are in the app. And I told them about editing, I told them about reading, and they were excited. But when I showed them the fact they could save pages, and not ever have to think about connectivity, it just worked out of the box on their Android device, that was a game changer for them. When they realized that in environments where they don't have strong connectivity, they can still get access to Wikipedia consistently on devices here, all the way back to Android 2.3, that was the most important feature for them. And I think it's really important to think about that when we're developing our features, is to leverage a lot of these advanced capabilities that these SDKs provide. Because to do the same thing on mobile web, well, it's not as possible. The storage capabilities of browsers are very inconsistent. And a lot of these users and a lot of the mobile browsers that they're using, especially on Android 2.2.3, don't work consistently. We spent a lot of time trying to make mobile web technologies work through um, Apache Cordova and PhoneGap, and we spent a lot of time fixing the browser bugs that existed in local storage on those older versions, and it was difficult to, to say the least. Any other questions? All right, thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Now we have May talking about UI. Consistency, consistency, consistency. as a designer. Today I'm going to be talking about uh, user interface consistency. And if you don't know what that means yet, you'll get to know about it more later. But first, I want to talk about this. Why do people trust Wikipedia so much? And, and I'm sure you're familiar with these guidelines. They, um, if you don't know them, you should, because they are here to they're here to be, uh, they're here to help the encyclopedia to be more uh, consistent in high quality content, uh, being neutral, credible, and 
most of all encyclopedic. It's not a graffiti wall. You cannot just write what you want. And these guidelines are actually created by these people who care about consistency in content. And I'm sure you've thought about these questions as well. Like, can I write about my dad? Can I express my own assumptions? Uh, can I use this as my, my source? Is this credible? What about the little sense of humor? And uh, these questions can actually be answered by those guidelines and, and more. Um, you can find these anywhere on Wikipedia or any other projects. You can expect things like, uh, let me see, like don't, like, uh, don't copy long text guidelines, don't uh, signature guidelines, even uh, photography guidelines, licensing guidelines, uh, the Wikipedia work more guideline, and even the porn star guideline. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of things that you can you, you can get here. Um, so it's really obvious that we're all control freaks. <laughs> but now, from the people who care about consistency in the user interface, we want to create. We want to build something. We want to build our interface so our interface is consistently delightful. So whether you access uh, Wikipedia on your mobile phone only, or uh, desktop only, or if you uh, consume Wikipedia with your eyes, or with a screen reader, or if you read from left to right, or uh, right to left, did I get the directions right? <laughs> <laughs> or down the center of your screen, from urban Wikipedia to Russian Wiktionary, or if, you're, if, or if you are a dichromat or a monochromat, we want you to feel like we care about you. We want you to feel like we get you, we, we, we know your intuition, and uh, feel like home and feel invited to, to stay around. So for the technical editors, um, if they have these questions like, how do I style or design this page, or should I care about how my buttons look, or can I use my favorite color? We want them to be able to point them to this guideline and be like, find your answers here, and uh, you can you can stop worrying about the boring details and just let us help you with those details, and you can keep making uh, cooler stuff for us. And for the uh, consumers of content. We want them to feel. We want them to. We want them to be able to expect an icon represent only one thing, and not sixteen other things, or sixteen other meanings that is being represented with one icon. So this is only an audit that I've done just with a few Wikipedia pages, and as you can see here, there's uh, the star icon is being represented with a lot of other meanings. And I'm not saying that this is bad, I'm just saying that they're very, very different. So I want to show you what we've uh, started to do a little bit, and I'm going to show you how it looks like as of today. So this is, this is, a, this is a lifestyle that you can go to the site that I just showed you. It's being built with KSS. Uh, what that means is that we were able to show the examples here live to you when uh, these controls are being documented. And I'm gonna just run you through the uh, anatomy of the page. So on the left here, you see all the elements, uh, patterns, styles, the vision, the UI vision. And then down the center of the screen, you have uh, the tail of the element. In this case, it's buttons. And then you see what's following after that is a code snippet of the CSS and what it produces on its right. And in, this, and in the description, it tells you um, how you can use it, when to use it, uh, where to use it. So you know it takes a lot. It, it takes out a lot of mystery. And at the bottom, if you scroll down, you'll be able to see an example of how it can be applied to real life and. Uh, you know, and, and apply to real life in, in context with other uh, content as well as UI elements. And you know what would be really great is if we also not only see how it looks like in real life, but also hear how it sounds like in real life. But, 
but catering to every one of you is, is so hard. It's, it's not easy. And I hate to say the words disability, accessibility, or impairment. I just know that we're all different. We feel comfortable very, very different. So some of the things that, I'm, that we're starting to think about is you know, clear navigation for both people who read with their eyes and people who listen with the screen reader. We want them to be able to um, navigate easily. Like I said, we're, we're all different, and and um, we don't. I, I don't want anyone to feel like we're. Uh, I don't want anyone to feel like we're we're a second citizen. We want everyone to be to be considered. We don't want to be an afterthought. And if you don't, if you guys don't know what a screen reader is, it's um, it's a software that people who don't see use to listen to what's on the screen. The next thing is responsive buttons and content uh, for various languages and devices. So they, um, so no matter if you're on mobile device or if you uh, read early Wikipedia, the button is going to be responsive to your character um, anatomy and uh, you know your text don't get cut and such and such. So the next thing is just being very very minimal in our interface. So. Um, what that means is less verbose. For example, on screen readers, we don't want uh, we don't want so we don't want it to be so compli complicated. We want it to be as simple as possible. Um, less elements to process and giving the elements just enough so people can just move on with their tasks. Because people react positively when things are clear and understandable. But we have. You know, we have users telling us, um, this is how very our users are. We have users telling us, you know, high contrast really hurts my eye. And when we switch it out a little bit more and it becomes lower contrast and, and we still get complaints on the other side saying, oh my god, I cannot see this, I cannot read this, I need, you know, I need, I need to not use Wikipedia anymore. <laughs> so what I'm saying here is we're working on a solution that enables you to switch easily to something that's more comfortable to you. And um, hopefully what that means is that it makes you stay longer and you learn more from us. And most of all, you share more knowledge with us all. So feel free to start using what we have now, knowing that we will be building on this. We will keep improving what we currently have. Um, you know our vision. And if you have any insights, talk to me. Um, if you have any technical questions, go there. I'm just a designer. I cannot answer those questions. Um, but this this slide is available on the programs page, so talk to me. Thank you. That's all. back on schedule we're now actually running early which is amazing so there'll be plenty of time for questions after the next session so uh, give us a moment while we set up
Does anyone have any objection to waiting about 10 minutes while I Google frantically around trying to debug Linux? <laughs> Alternately, does anyone know why Ubuntu does not recognize this cable? <laughs> Who's Alex Slender? <laughs> well, if the problem is you're using the wrong light bulb distribution, what you need to do is recompile the light bulb from source and then. <laughs> <laughs> of writing this presentation after three years using LibreOffice discovered how to transition between bullet points. <laughs> yes. <Wow>. Cool. <coughs> this will be fun. <laughs> All right. Um, is just marvelous fun. Our medical covers like neck injuries, right? <laughs> okay, that works. Um, I should apologize in advance. In the tradition that dogs end up looking like their owners, my slides are a lot less pretty than either Tomas's or May's, for which I apologize. Um, uh, a second apology, which comes with sort of two subpoints. Um, as of the moment of presenting this, I have been awake for 25 hours, finishing this off so that I could present this. Um, the, the two caveats that this adds to the presentation. First, it may be terrible, and I have no longer, uh, idea how long it will take, so don't expect us to end 10 minutes early. Um, <laughs> and the second, when I get sleep deprived, I, I try and be funny, and also lose the ability to be any good at it. Um, so, so a simple heuristic that you might like to apply, um, as this presentation contains both stabs at humor and science, if you agree with something, that was a fact, whereas if you dispute it, that was an attempt at humor. I find <laughs> that if you simply apply this rule, it will go a lot better for me, at least. Um, so as the presentation says, uh, I'm Oliver, I'm a research analyst at the Wikimedia Foundation, and I have an inane appreciation for meta-humor. Um, to answer, by the way, a common question of does Big in Japan refer to the Tom Waits song or the Alphaville song, the answer is uh, neither. It's a reference to a song called Strawberry Jam by a band called Kiss JC, who no one's ever heard of for very good reasons. Um, so I started editing Wikipedia in 2005. I've written 968 articles and 77,787 uh, edits, which sounds like a made-up number. Um, that's including the archive table where I have 19,999 contributions, which also sounds like a made-up number. That's the best I can do. Um, I'm a traffic analyst at the Wikimedia Foundation. I handle most of our um, uh, ad hoc traffic analysis, rather than Eric Zakte, who handles sort of all our production-ready stuff. Um, I'm also the geolocation specialist and geodata specialist, uh, and also the guy who knows where the bodies live, because I spent more time having to deal with MediaWiki's weird database systems than uh, most of the people on the team. Uh, basically, the rule is, if the data set in question would drive any reasonable human being insane, they give it to me on the grounds that the damage has already been done, and so really there's no cost if I fail. Um, oh, meh. Too far. Oh, I forgot, I don't have right click on this laptop, do I? There is context for the, uh, context for the dinosaurs, I promise. Um, so, the context of dinosaurs is, despite doing all of these things and being all of these things is actually the first research presentation I've ever done um, uh, outside of the research showcase which is attended by maybe 15 people. 
Um, it's also the first sort of pseudo academic one that I've ever done. And so I went to my friend Dan, who's who's my best friend and my former housemate and is a PhD student in history, and I said, you know, do you have any advice for doing this kind of thing? Um, and, and the product of 13 years in the British higher education system, who's written many journal articles and everything else, had the following to say, put some dinosaurs in because everyone likes dinosaurs. <laughs> Your tax pounds at work. So there's a dinosaur. It's a very nice dinosaur. It's an openly licensed dinosaur. I would have done a Stegosaurus because I like the Thagomizer, um, but unfortunately all the Stegosaurus images on Commons have a factual accuracy disputed tag on them. <laughs> Which, how does the guy who added it know? <laughs> so, um, much like the previous presentation, or the first presentation was sort of here is a success story, here is a failure story, um, this is one success story and one failure story, and um, appropriately I've managed to thematically divide it into two ways of looking at mobile uh, in terms of editing, uh, one of which we're good at and one of which we're bad at. Um, so, so the first way of looking at mobile is uh, we get more contributions from people who already own it. Uh, and the second way of looking at it is uh, dealing with systemic bias. In other words, dealing with the problem of, um, yes, we can get lots of contributions from people who already edit, but given the people who already edit are mostly you know, white males from Europe and the North America between the ages of, of 15 and 60, it, probably not solving any of the, the uh, problems that come from you know, cultural ignorance. Um, I start off as a legal editor, please do not look up our article on law, do not look at the section marked Islamic law, it is not great. <laughs> um, so, on the first one, uh, getting more contributions from existing people. Um, what we mean there is, if we're getting edits on desktop devices, we're only getting some editor time, right? You only spend some of your time on your laptop or on your uh, uh, PC, you only have Wi-Fi sometimes, you only have a wide connection sometimes. Um, we tend to get edits from people at work, uh, edits from people pretending to work. Um, this is where all my contributions come from. Um, and uh, people who are at home, they've got home from work and they're sort of lying there and they want something that is relatively non-cognitively taxing and involves pretty shapes. Um, so they do new page control. Uh, and that's, you know, great and all, with one problem, except uh, which is that that's actually a fairly small chunk of time. I mean, it's not a tiny chunk of time. If it was a tiny chunk of time, we wouldn't have four million articles on one project alone. Um, but it's definitely missing spaces out. Um, and reducing the barrier to mobile contributions allows us to grab people when they wouldn't otherwise be available on desktop devices. Uh, we can get them when they're on the train home from work. We can get them when they're sat in front of the TV. Uh, we can get them when they're in bed. Uh, this sounds stupid, I will explain why it's not. Um, so I decided that it would be fun to test this and to see how well we're actually doing here. Um, and the code we use for geolocation, amongst other things, allows us to extract time zones associated with IP addresses. Which means that what we can do is we can geolocate the IP addresses associated with edits and then take the server-side timestamps and then localize them. So that instead of knowing that an edit was made at 9 p.m. UTC, we know that the edit was made at 4 p.m. user local time. And we can look at um, what patterns and rhythms do user contributions follow uh, in, in their own local time. When in their day do people contribute? Um, yep. Uh, and the answer, as distorted as it is, which is called um, converting from PDF to SVG in ink, uh, which you've never done before while cussing, um, suggests that, well, actually mobile is having a big difference. Um, if you look at the top right, you'll see that around sort of 9, 10 p.m. we get this very large spike in mobile where there wouldn't be, it isn't equivalent activity in desktop, or there's much lower equivalent activity in desktop. And that follows a, a substantial rise from sort of the end of work onwards where desktop edits are suppressed. Um, so the takeaways, it was 5 a.m. I've got to be honest, I, I was easily amused. Um, <laughs> the takeaways are first that it's working. We're getting mobile contributions when we don't normally get desktop attention. Um, we're getting it late in the evening. Uh, we're getting it on the commute. Um, and the second of which is that most people get really bored of their jobs at around 1 p.m. That's when mobile contributions start tracking up. It looks like if you have a project you want one of your employees to work on, middle managers take notes. I can see my boss sat over there. Um, Give it to them so that they have to work on it sometime between nine and lunch, and then you're fine. 
or just shuts off their internet connection, one of the two. <laughs> um, so then the sec second front is uh, combating systemic bias, which I said is the problem of, uh, we have a lot of people from relatively narrow cultural backgrounds and relatively narrow national backgrounds. Um, uh, the fundamental thing here is that one of the big blockers to contributing is just access. Can you get to Wikipedia? Can you do it in a way that allows for editing? Um, in a lot of places, it's very difficult to say, get a desktop computer or a laptop. Or if you can get it, very difficult to get a consistent connection to the internet. Or if you can get that, very difficult to get a consistent <coughs> fast connection to the internet, and so on and so forth. Um, by enabling mobile, what we're doing is um, allowing for methods which aren't necessarily dependent on these blockers. There is, for one major example, a lot, uh, much smaller financial uh, uh, investment associated with getting a mobile phone and an associated data plan than with desktop computer and peripherals and you know wireless connection and waiting for the guy to turn up to set up the wireless connection and then being told it will be there between 9 and 1 and then waiting until 4 a.m. and finally giving up the ghost. Um, mobile is an excellent example of a way of doing this. Uh, so what does the status quo look like? In other words, if we had no mo mobile contributions at all, if all we had were desktop edits, and if we geolocated those edits and the people who made them, uh, what would our contributor base and our contribution base look like? I will warn you in advance that the answer is profoundly depressing and the people with mild heart conditions should leave. Uh, <laughs> people with severe heart conditions are welcome to stay. <laughs> uh, there's an excellent Diderot quote, I'm stealing this from, from Brandon, or at least the principle of putting one in, which is, that a citizen of the world reporting things of the day as if it were 2,000 years in the past and those of the place they live in as if it was 2,000 leagues distant is exactly the sort of person who should be writing an encyclopedia. And I'm very proud to say that we uh, excel at this. We truly do, because, and I've got some bad news here, if you're not in the United States, anything you write about is 2,000 leagues distant. Um, I pro apologize for the uh, color scheme. It is very difficult to come up with a um, monochromatic series that is not you know, very, very light green at one end um, or completely unreadable at the other. Uh, as you can see, uh, well, first, Chad is a lake, evidently. Um, but more importantly, most of our contributions are on desktop are clustered around the United States, and most of the remainder are clustered around uh, Western Europe. And uh, with some activity in Russia and slightly less activity in places like India, um, these are uh, desktop-only editors, of course, not necessarily edits. So there might be a difference there. Maybe you know the editors are distributed like this, but we know that there is a, a power law that a very small number of people contribute a lot, and they might live in different places. And uh, okay, <laughs> mm, yeah, pretty much the same thing. So if we just had desktop, we would be incredibly biased towards uh, the Western world. Um, although doing all right on Brazilian coverage, it looks like, which is nice. Um, so then the question is, what does the data set look like for mobile? Um, if mobile is such an excellent way of reaching out to people with a uh, lower barrier to, to access, um, how are we doing in, in enabling these people to contribute? Um, to which the answer is, uh, well, there are more bits of Africa that don't have any observations at all. And other than that, it's pretty much the same. Um, India is slightly more prominent, which is nice. Uh, and the same, again, is true with mobile edits. But overall, we're not actually doing that much better when it comes to uh, using mobile as a way of getting contributions of contributors uh, from cultural and national backgrounds that are traditionally underrepresented in our editor base. Um, the yeah, sorry. Um, this is what happens when you manually decide to modify it at stupid o'clock. Um, anyway, so this is kind of profoundly depressing. And here's an example of how profoundly depressing it is. We have five times as many mobile edits from uh, the United States than we do from India. India has four times the population. India is a country so big that two of the states have been ruled by different communist parties for the last 20 years, and most people in the Western world haven't noticed, because so many things can go on there without impacting on, on anything that we see. And they have a fifth of the mobile contributions that you know, the United States does. Um, and this is, 
Yes, sorry, uh, for the next slide. Like I said, very sleep deprived. Um, so this is profoundly depressing, but maybe there's a way around it. So maybe the answer is, okay, people on mobile don't necessarily come from different backgrounds, but maybe they contribute in different ways. Um, maybe they edit in areas which are substantially different. Um, this is where the presentation verges from uh, science into what we affectionately refer to as anecdata. Um, it uses a very small sample because it is impossible to efficiently generate this data with big samples using a single laptop. Um, so if you take all the mobile edits and all the desktop edits and you randomly sample 44,000 from each, uh, which was picked because it was 10% of the smallest of those two sets, um, and you use wiki project tags as a way of extracting thematic data, I mean, what are these articles about? Um, and you take, say, the most prominent wiki projects associated with the mobile sample and the most prominent wiki projects associated with the desktop sample, um, and you frantically make a plot at 7.30 a.m., you end up with something that looks a lot like this. Uh, so for context, uh, if you can't see the tiny labels, uh, blue is mobile and red is desktop. Those columns where there are both values is uh, are, are um, themes which they have in common. Those where there is only one are themes that they have distinctly. Um, and what this suggests, although I said it's quite a small sample, um, is essentially that what we have here is a situation where people aren't contributing to substantially different content. I mean, there are distinct themes and distinct categories. Um, so, for example, uh, uh, Canada and women's history only appear in the top 20 for mobile edits, which I'm pretty sure Sue Gardner um, called at 3 a.m. Uh, before anyone judges me for that joke, uh, Kat Walsh came up with it. So if you don't like it, it is her fault. And if you do like it, then you should congratulate me on having the fine taste to see it. Um, but largely, the categories intersect very prominently. The top 20 mobile ones and the top 20 desktop ones have tons in common, right down to uh, the proportions between the two. Um, and so it looks like we're not actually doing well here either. We haven't succeeded so far in getting a much wider culture, uh, content base, uh, contributor base in cultural terms, and it doesn't look like we're succeeding in persuading the people we do get to edit substantially different content. Um, so yes, we're doing a good job of getting people to edit at different times thanks to mobile. We can get them to contribute at times when they would previously have left, or fallen asleep, or turned on Netflix. Um, we're not doing a good job getting people to edit different things, and we're definitely not doing a good job getting different people to edit. So I want to come back to this because I think this is very important. Um, if you are not either the very, very dark shade of green or the merely very dark shade of green, um, you should pay attention to the next bit. The next bit is about ways that you can help solve the problem and ways that you can use your expertise to, to inform the mobile team and what they work on um, and avoid, as I, can dem as I demonstrated, I know where you will live, having me show up at your house and make you even more miserable than listening to my monotonous droning voice has already succeeded in doing. Um, the f first thing that you can do if you are anyone, if you are an editor, if you are a reader, if you are someone who thinks mobile is important, is go to mobile, as Tomas suggested, and tell the developers about the problems that you face trying to contribute on mobile. Maybe there's a language support problem, maybe there's a browser support problem, maybe there's a, a specific form of phone that's very popular where you come from that isn't supported by the existing infrastructure. Um, if you're an engineer, write code, patches, or new features, or better language support, or so on and so forth. Um, and if you're a researcher, hi Scott, um, come up with research questions. How can we do this better? What are we missing? What should we be measuring that we're not in tracking how we do with not just getting more edits, but getting edits that actively solve the problem beyond we don't have enough edits? Um, if you're in the last category, please email them to me as soon as I finish this presentation and answer any questions, I'm going to go pass out. <laughs> All right, and credits, code base, visualizations. Does anyone have any questions? Nope.
that could be a really fascinating tool, like a way for people to look up like how how closely do the areas they edit in mesh with what they where they actually live. Yeah. So if my centre of gravity in the middle of Africa pretty good, is it actually temporary mm. for my house? Not yeah. Good? Well, I was not even I was thinking not even geographic basis because the problem there is that it would require us to expose where people live. Um, I was more thinking in the, in the simple sense of um, if we had a way of getting this data and providing it automatically so that you can provide user X's contributions and say, these are the areas that they most commonly edit in. And the user can look at them and say, you know, these match up with my interests, or yeah. these don't. Or, well, I know what I mean. So, like, <laughs> show me where the editing center was, I go, oh, that's pretty good. Oh, that's pretty good. Anyway, that's a good idea. I like it. Um, if there are any tool developers in the room who think that would be fun to work on, do it. Any others? I can't see it at the back, so... Oh, no, oh, there, there is one thing now. Yes? Have you tried scaling the number of mobile versus desktop contributors? Have you tried scaling that by some form of measured internet penetration? Uh, not yet. Lots of US contributors is kind of what we already know. Yes, uh, not yet. Um, uh, uh, Han, a researcher at the uh, Oxford Internet Institute, has a wonderful post up on um, internet uh, penetration progression over time in China, which I was planning to use but only discovered at 4 a.m. Um, so I haven't done it yet. Um, but there are a lot of things that, that we could do around that. So we could look at um, uh, ratios, for example, rather than simply mobile raw number versus SS raw number, um, or even sort of the, the average number of edits per mobile or per desktop uh, user per country. Uh, we could look at uh, internet penetration ratios. We could look at population ratios. <coughs> There's a lot of stuff we could do. Um, this is very, very preliminary and something I'm interested in, in further exploring. Yes? Uh, yes, with the exception of the thematic analysis at the end, which I had to do on EnverKey because unfortunately um, I yeah. don't know the Kinetica for A class articles of high importance. And so excluding that is hard. Okay. Yeah. Is there any way of knowing with different devices, like by mobile handset brand, or the smartphone yes. versus smartphone? Yes. Um, so as well as being the geolocation guy and the traffic data guy, I'm also, as a consequence, the user agent passing guy. Um, uh, there was a mobile metrics presentation last month, I think, which I, Leila Zia did, and Dario Tararelli and myself, um, which looked at uh, different device classes and, and how they line up in different countries and different regions um, with both reader data and editor data, which I'm happy to point anyone to um, once I have my laptop back into the Google Cloud. Cool. <laughs> this is going to get really boring by the end. What do you want for lunch? <laughs> <laughs> great work. I, I love it. Great story. I was curious, um, beyond editing, if, the, if you've looked at mobile and whether it's changed who's viewing the encyclopedias of consumption of them. Mm. Um, the answer is yes. And with readers, it's very dramatically different. Um, so with readers, you see a lot of activity um, in the uh, Indian subcontinent, particularly India, not so much Pakistan, for reasons that I don't fully comprehend, but I'm just a researcher. I, I'm not a specialist in, in sort, of, um, sort of cultural and, and country-based uh, issues in that field. Um, and the Middle East, particularly Egypt. Uh, we're very, very popular in Egypt when it comes to reading data. Uh, I will also point you to that data. <laughs> That is an excellent question. I should find that out. <laughs> you realize you just ensured I won't sleep for another two days, right? Yes, Adam. Uh, so <clears throat> I, I should probably uh, uh, whip myself through the street for not asking this yesterday, but related to the, the question of how readership looks differently on mobile, um, do you, do you have a, a gut sense, because I suspect that you don't have a specific sense, but do you have a gut sense of, of countries which are particularly more likely to edit versus read, and particularly less likely to edit versus read, or have editors versus readers, you know what I mean? Uh, not yet. That's, again, something that's dependent on getting things like population data and internet penetration data. Um, it wouldn't. The, the thing is, we don't track, uh, for example, uh, unique reader IDs. We don't have those, and as a result, it's hard to 
join up parity between and we have the end readers and n over five editors from this country and so on. Um, Fair enough. But it's hopefully something we'll be able to do in the future. <coughs> Small edits, yeah, um, they tend to. Uh, there are so there are sort of um, uh, two long tails in in uh, traditional desktop editing. The first is contribution size. Um, you have a, a sort of small number of very large contributions, and sort of a uh, very strong scale down. And the second is um, uh, clustering of edits around common article titles or article IDs. Um, mobile has does not have the first, but does have the second. Uh, mobile users tend to make much smaller edits and. Uh, the, the variance in the edits tends to be uh, smaller. Uh, so, so it's not just they tend to make small ones, it's you know, a narrow range. Okay, anything else? Please, I want to sit down. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So different projects? Yeah. Just to You know, there's actually a researcher who did some really fascinating work around users who switch between um, uh, multiple language uh, projects. Um, he's sitting in the trunk row and he's great. I would strongly advise talking him off the that. <laughs> See, this is why I love having researchers. This is why I love, um, you know, reading papers by people who later attend talks I give. I get to find out all the difficult questions on them. <laughs> yes. Do you have any statistics on uh, edit sizes depending on desktop uh, versus mobile? Um, other than a gut, I remember calculating this at some point, uh, but not what it is. Uh, not really. That was the the question earlier about uh, sort of edit size and variance uh, from the gentleman in the fourth row. Um, I think the mobile team might gather that. It's yeah. About, it's about half the size. Yeah. Sorry. Um, it's about half the size on average. Uh, mobile versus desktop per invite. Though there's a lot of corrections that Possibly. Um, <laughs> well, so, so it could be anything. It could be a correction. It could be a this guy died. It could be lots of stuff. Um, I, I haven't dug into the data in that much detail to be able to, to distinguish. It's notoriously difficult to uh, non-manually classify uh, edits by sort of user intent and, and edit type. It would be interesting if there are actually people writing all articles on mobile. Mm. That would be. I don't have the data on that, but it would be. <laughs> OK, any final questions? No? Cool. Okay. Wait. Oh. <laughs> Tom. I wouldn't mind so much if it wasn't the people who were slowing me down being people I know. <laughs> You've had like all week to bug me. True. Um, <laughs> do you still have your graphs of power users doing mobile editing versus non power users? Uh, the circadian editing? rhythms? Yeah. Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> Wait, what? No. Oh, damn. Um, yes, I do, but I'm not getting the frick in my neck necessary to retrieve them right now. Okay. Oh. Yeah, sorry about that. That, that was at about 8.30 a.m. And it was the last tweak I needed to make. Um, I'm going to see Smack mortify myself and sit down now. <laughs> to Thomas, May, and a very sleep-deprived Oliver. I think we all enjoyed that. <laughs> we have bought back a little bit of time, so uh, we have a break coming up, and we'll be restarting in here at 11.30. Uh, so enjoy your coffees and teas.